Tom Woods here. We're talking about what to do when you get pulled over by the police. And we're getting the perspective of former Deputy Sheriff Eddie Craig. Suppose I'm speeding along on the highway, and I mean that literally. I'm actually speeding along, and I get stopped. Tell me what I should do, and tell me maybe what the average person is doing that's a mistake. Uh, well, you do, of course, pull over, but you want to do it in a place where you've acknowledged the officer either by waving at them, turning on your emergency signal, and pulling over at the closest public safe place that you can. You definitely want it to be public these days. You don't want to pull over just anywhere. Once they come up to the window, don't answer questions. The more you talk, the worse things are going to be and the more they will dig. What most people don't understand is that an officer's first job when he gets you pulled over for a traffic stop is to attempt to escalate that stop to either a DUI or a drug bust. He doesn't care about the traffic. That's just his premise for pulling you over. His real goal is to get inside that car and see what else he can find. So even when I'm clearly going over the speed limit, you're telling me that, by and large, there's some ulterior motive for pulling me up. I've never had anybody look through my car. They give me the uh, the ticket, they've made their 150 bucks, and they move on. It's true that in the training, that's what they are taught to do. I am an ex-deputy. I've been through this. They are taught to find ways to keep the person in the car talking and answering questions that will allow them to continue their fishing expedition. That's one of the reasons why when an officer walks up, he goes, hi, do you know why I stopped you? He's first off trying to get you to make an admission when yeah. you realize that's what you're doing or not. And then he's got you for that at a minimum. Then as you're talking, you can say, well, yeah, I just came from a party and I'm on my way home. And you go, oh, really? Were you drinking at this party? Were there drugs at this party? Do you have anything in the car that I should know about, that you want to tell me about? These are all questions to escalate that stop if you make the mistake of answering them or answering anything in a way that will allow him to infer those things. But on the other hand, aren't there some things that I could say that would make it less likely that I'd wind up getting a ticket? Maybe I'd just get a slap on the wrist instead. Is there nothing I can say? That is always up to the individual officer. The officer is going to do what he's going to do regardless of what you say or do. He'll have his own motives for why he tickets you or why he doesn't. For instance, here in Texas, it's perfectly lawful to carry a handgun inside your car when you're traveling around and... You'll have a cop that'll ask you if you have any guns in the car, even though it's none of his business, and he's not stopping you for anything relating to that. Yet, if you tell them you have one, they're going to get you out of that car, they're going to take the gun, and they're going to go run it on their computer. And now, whether you like it or not, even if you never had the gun registered anywhere, now it's linked to you. So they're, they're always looking for ways to get their hands into something. Tell me about the script that you wrote the transportation script is based upon United States Supreme Court case law. And what it is there for is to help you understand exactly how your rights are being violated in these so-called traffic stops. Everything that these officers do is meant to trick you into something they can actually arrest you for. Now, what most folks don't know about the law here in Texas is that the way the statute is written, the moment the officer turns on the lights on his cruiser, you are in a custodial arrest. We even have case law here from 2008, a case called Aziz v. State, where the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals ruled that is the case. A warrantless arrest can't be done under suspicion. It can only be done under probable cause. And he has to be able to articulate the facts that that probable cause is based on if you ask him to do so. Most of these officers can't. They're stopping you based upon a traffic infraction that here in Texas they treat as criminal, even though it's absolutely not criminal under any common law perception. There's no victim. There is no intent. None of those things exist in these so-called traffic offenses. Yet they use that to seize and arrest you. And the more you talk while you're in custody, the worse things can get very, very quickly because the courts have said that a person that is in custody that has been apprised of their rights, which is something else they don't ever do in these traffic stops, anything they say can be used against them because it's made willingly and knowingly. It's voluntary. 
So the script is there to teach you that by opening your mouth and answering the questions this officer has, you are actually potentially confessing to additional crimes or additional things that they can use against you. You have the right to remain silent, and you should be exercising it. Let's act it out. How about you be the officer and I be the person? I'm a regular guy. I don't know any of the ins and outs. And you show me the mistakes I'm making. You want to do that? I, I can do that. And I'll show you just how quickly an officer can take something you say, twist it, and escalate this situation on you. All right. So I've, I'm driving along. I've just rolled down my window and you say to me. Excuse me, sir. Do you know why I've pulled you over? Uh, no, officer. I do not. Well, you were going 85 back here, and this is a 60-mile-an-hour zone. Do you have some particular emergency reason that you're going so fast on this stretch of highway? Oh, jeez, I already feel like I'm going to make a mistake here. <laughs> um, no, I guess not. So do you realize what a public safety hazard is for you to travel down this road in that manner and endanger the public? Well, I mean, I understand that, but it does seem like the flow of traffic was at about that speed. The speed limit, however, is 60 regardless of the flow of traffic. You understand that, right? You saw the sign. Yes, I do. I, I didn't see the sign, but I, I, I'm sure you're telling me the truth. Now, when you said, yes, I do right there, you just confessed to knowing you had done it wrong. Ah, uh, okay. So the more that you talk to me, the more I'm fishing out of you. You see how this is working? So let, let's continue this for just a yeah, second. Yeah, okay. Uh, excuse me, sir. I need your license, registration, and proof of financial responsibility, please. Okay, so then I hand over these things. Was that a mistake? That's an absolute mistake. But how can it be? If I if I give them these things, I can drive away in five minutes. If I don't, I got an ordeal in my hands. That may be the case, but you are waiving very important rights when you do that. That is exactly what they're counting on. They have made this system convenient to allow your rights to be violated in a way that you would much rather have that happen than stand up for them. That is exactly what this system is designed to do. What they've done is they've made you make a choice. Would you rather leave in five minutes instead of sitting here, or would you rather waive your rights and let me violate them so I can take money out of your pocket later? Exactly how have my rights been violated in this encounter so far? Okay, the right to remain silent does not just limit you to not having to answer questions. It also is a right to not produce anything that can be used against you in a court of law. And everything you just produced can do exactly that. Let's say, for instance, you produced your license and yesterday was your birthday and you haven't been down to the DPS office lately to get your license renewed before it expired on your birthday. You just handed him an expired license. Now he can charge you in addition to the speeding for an expired license. You've just asked me for these three documents. So let me change my answer. Instead of here you go, is my answer silence or is my answer I choose not to produce those documents? Or is it a third answer? It's a third answer. The answer is, officer, can any of the information that you are demanding from me be used against me in a court of law or to potentially incriminate me in any way? That's a question relating to your Fifth Amendment protections. The officer is obligated to tell you whether or not he can use that information. The fact is, he can, and you should know that up front. He can use it, but he didn't tell you what your rights were. The reason you want to do this before he gets his hands on this is now you can show that this was not a voluntary surrender, and that statement can later be suppressed at trial where he can't use that information against you because it was illegally obtained. So when you ask him that question and he either refuses to answer or gets belligerent or whatever, then you have a follow-up response. Officer, I believe the information can be used against me. Therefore, I invoke my right to remain silent. Do you intend to retaliate or punish me for simply invoking my protected right to remain silent? Now you've put him on the hook. Anything he does is going to show that he clearly understands what you just did, but you're going to do what he wants regardless of what your rights are. Should I be using one of these apps in my phone to record the conversation? Should I get that ready as the officer's coming to the car? I'd record every encounter with a public servant. I don't care who it is. My main rule to everybody that comes to my class or listens to my show is, in today's America, don't walk out of the front door of your house any day of the week without something that records audio and video, preferably more than one something. As soon as you even suspect you're about to get pulled over, start recording. 
If I'm getting pulled over, I start my recording. I say the date, the time, where I am, and what agency I think it is that's behind me and about to pull me over. Now, if you take an approach like this, it seems to me there are two possible outcomes. One, the officer becomes more agitated and more belligerent because you're not acting the way the typical motorist will behave. But secondly, it could be the officer will say, oh, it's one of these people, and I just I don't want to deal with it. I, I don't want to deal with the YouTube that's going to come out regarding this. I don't want to deal with whatever he's going to pull in court. I'm just going to let the guy go. Is there any? Do you have a sense of what the more likely outcome is? Can we have a sense of that? No, because... Like I say, that's going to be completely up to the individual temperament of the officer you've encountered. The problem is the Supreme Court has ruled that police departments can intentionally hire people of low intelligence over those with high intelligence. There's a reason for this. Departments want people that will follow orders and not question orders. They will do what they're told. They don't know enough to go read the actual law, and if they do go read it, they don't know enough to actually understand it. This is the biggest failing in our law enforcement agencies. They are given very, very superficial training on how to understand statutes. They believe that everything they're reading, they understand, when in fact, like the general public, they are charging with these things. They don't understand it any better than the general public does. When you exercise these rights and that cop goes off on a tangent, either getting belligerent or saying, you know what, sir, have a nice day, there's no way to know how that's going to come out. But the moment you waive those rights, you need to understand you cannot get them back. Let's say that I've followed your advice and I have not handed over the documents. And I asked, could these be used against me? And I'm told that, yes, they could. Then how does the interaction proceed from there? If the officer is willing to acknowledge you have the right to refuse based upon that, it's very simple. But most of them don't. Most of them are going to immediately respond, the law says you have to produce it on demand. And that's true. The statute says that when a peace officer, a magistrate, or certain other people demand production of these documents, you have to produce them. But what that statute does is violate the Fifth Amendment. It completely violates your right to remain silent by saying that you have to produce this when that information can be used to charge you or be used against you in some way in a court of law. It's an illegal seizure of that information, so it violates your Fourth Amendment as well. It's just one of those things where without understanding how these statutes are being written to intentionally deprive you of rights, you may not have the courage to stand up and make that stand. But if you do understand it and you're not going to waive those rights, then you have to understand that saying that is your right. Officer, I can't provide you with that if you can use it against me. You should know that. As a peace officer, you are required to protect me, my person and my rights. And one of my rights is the right to remain silent. So the general principles you're talking about are generally applicable across all 50 states? Yes. No person has a different set of fundamental rights in Texas than they do in Pennsylvania or New York. They're the same across the board. If you do the things that you have every right to do, then the officer gets belligerent because that is not the obsequious individual he has come to know and expect from his prior interactions with the public. He now expects you to waive those fundamental rights upon demand so he can do his job quicker, simpler, and easier, even though it harms you in the process. And the website? The website is www.ruleoflawradio.com or logosradionetwork.com.